Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the roundtable session. Um, the roundtables at today's conference are brought to us by our sponsors at Amazie.io, uh, Previous Next, Skipper and Pantheon. And um, speaking in this session today is Danielle Scheffler, taking us through um, incorporating accessibility into your project lifecycle. And uh, this is one that I know that our team's very keen on uh, hearing and looking forward to. So I'll hand over to Danielle now and take it away. All right, thank you, uh, Dave, really appreciate it. Um, as uh, Dave said, I am Danielle Scheffler. I am the Accessibility Practice Lead at Salsa Digital, um, and I'm very excited to um, speak with all of you today, both as part of this uh, lightning talk as well as the roundtable. Um, so in terms of what we're covering, I know that we are looking into talking about how accessibility fits into the project life cycle, but there are several topics that we don't really get into um, sometimes in terms of a, making sure everybody's aligned on what accessibility actually is, uh, making sure we're talking about how the fact that yes, accessibility is the law, uh, but we also wanna make sure that we're thinking about it as accessibility first, focused on empathy, uh, and also talking a little bit about terminology. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we don't necessarily talk about what are the appropriate terms uh, when we're talking about people with disabilities, as well as people that don't have disabilities. Um, and then I promise we won't get into the meat of talking about accessibility in the project life cycle, um, as well as going into just, you know, some key resources that uh, hopefully you all will be able to uh, take away with you. Um, so in terms of what you need to know before you get started, um, if we look at this definition of accessibility, I don't usually read things directly from the screen, but I'm going to do it this time. Um, it's the degree to which a product, device, service, or environment is available to as many people as possible on as many devices, so visual browser, screen reader, mobile device, as possible. Notice that disabilities are not mentioned with this definition. A lot of times, right, that's where we're very, very focused, but really accessibility is accessible for all. It's making sure that we're trying to be inclusive. Uh, it's making sure that we're thinking about as many use cases, um, that we're not, you know, focused on one piece of the population or one part of the population that is really for as many people um, as possible. And so it's something to focus on uh, as we're designing and, and building sites and applications. So, Right, I talked a little bit earlier, gave a, a little bit of a teaser that we'll talk about how empathy is important. So the first bullet, I think, shocks people a little bit. Um, but we do have to admit that the world is still a bit ableist um, because we all come from our experiences. It, it's not intentional, um, you know, the majority of the time, um, but it is true. And I even think about something, uh, for example, that I saw on LinkedIn last month and it relates to presentations, it, it's very fitting, where somebody said, I really hate that people, you know, sometimes just read directly from their slides. I mean, it shows that they're unprofessional, it shows they don't know what they're doing, they're not prepared. You know, in some cases that might be true, but there were a lot of people that said, I agree, you know, it's not good, you know, uh, you should just walk out of a session, I think somebody said, if that happens. And somebody finally came in and said, I know this is probably not intentional, but that actually is a bit ableist because you have to remember that not everybody who's attending your session might be able to see it well. They might not be able to see it all. They might have a uh, cognitive issue. They might have a learning disability, you know, whatever it is. And so giving them as much information as possible does not necessarily mean that somebody is unprofessional or, you know, there's something wrong. Um, and so it's really just making sure that we're thinking about things from that lens. Um, the other piece, empathy allows us to try on the emotions of other people without having to be on be in their shoes, excuse me. Um, it is admittedly impossible to really understand if you don't have a disability. I have an invisible disability. I didn't know what it was like to have a disability until you know something uh, happened to me that uh, made me have a disability. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't empathize. It doesn't mean that you can't you know incorporate accessibility well. Um, it's just again, going back to that point that I made you know 30 seconds ago that we just really need to remember that we are shaped by our experiences and that we really have to you know make sure that we're open to, to know that we need to learn and, and to grow. Um, the third one, very important to me especially, um, people with disabilities are not inspirational solely 
because they have a disability. Um, I actually did not put a, an example of what I'm about to talk about because I, I didn't want to you know, spread this. Um, but I think a lot of us have seen those memes, right, where maybe somebody who um, has, you know, say, two prosthetics for, for legs, uh, and then it will say in, in big letters, like, what's your excuse? I mean, when I go run or when you go run or somebody else runs, right, um, they might not be told, oh, you're an inspiration just because you, you went outside and ran. Um, you know, maybe if you're going and running like 100 kilometers, like, yes, OK, that's inspirational. Right. But just going out and running um, might not really be inspirational because it's just a daily activity that we think about. Um, same thing. You know, somebody's not an inspiration just because they ran, you know, for example, because they have prosthetics. Um, so thinking about things from that perspective, um, start with just enough accessibility, as we know. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. There's a lot to know. There's a lot of guidelines. There's a lot of standards. Uh, you know, we might be talking about things today at the round table, or I might be mentioning things here that you weren't aware of. Um, I'm so happy, you know, that we can all learn together. Um, it's okay to start with like just enough but then focus on, on learning more, right? That's how we get better. Um, it's how we evangelize accessibility. Um, we're just really making sure that we're focusing on those pieces. Um, so along with that, uh, we know that WCAG 2.0, AA is the law, but WCAG 2.1 uh, opens up a lot of uh, other guidelines for mobile, responsive, you know, cognitive plus. 2.2 um, is coming out uh, sooner than we may think. Uh, and 3.0 is actually being um, in discussion, or sorry, is in discussions now. So uh, there's a lot um, there. So let's kind of move ahead and, and not just do um, what we need to. It, it's great if that's a starting point, but just thinking about going, you know, another step. Um, and then accessibility overlays. I could do a whole session on this. I actually have before. Um, but if you don't know what an accessibility overlay is, totally okay. Um, I have an example, you know, here of this little icon. Um, you'll see them a lot of times. You click on them. It, it comes up with something like this. Um, it says that they can make your site accessible with one click. Um, if it's too good to be true, it, it really is. Um, and that is just because of the fact that they actually often make things a lot more difficult for people with disabilities. Um, they read over screen readers. Um, there's a resource that I have later on uh, in the resource section where I think there are 567 of us now who have signed it. Um, it includes accessibility uh, consultants, experts, as well as uh, people with disabilities that say that these are actually doing more harm than good. So I'm asking, please, if you are building a site um, to not use them. And if you know somebody who is using them, um, you know, uh, like I said, I, I have some resources in the resources section um, to explain uh, why it is not the best idea ever. Um, and then very quickly to, you know, get into the, the rest of the presentation, uh, do's and don'ts of terminology. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody here, right, is is unique and special, um, but there is no such thing as, as specially abled, right? If you don't have a disability, doesn't mean that you're normal. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're specially abled. It just means that you are a person without a disability or you're non-disabled. Um, same thing with just in general. We always think about the person being the focus. Doesn't matter if they have a disability or they don't. Um, so persons with disabilities, not the disabled. Same thing, it's somebody who is intellectually disabled, they're not mentally handicapped, right? There isn't something wrong with them because they have a disability. So I know I spent a, a good portion on that, but I think it's just really important, you know, before we even get into incorporating some more of the, the technical and, and the tactical pieces um, that everybody understands um, a lot of, of that piece, or at least we touch on it first. Um, so talking about accessibility and projects. Um, so this is assuming um, that most people are doing uh, Agile. Um, and so even though we will talk about right discovery and development and kind of going from there, um, we will talk about ticketing and you know iterative process, et cetera. So the first thing is determine what accessibility guidelines you will follow, right? I know sometimes this is dependent on clients, et cetera, but, but that's the first thing. It's making sure that you know what those guidelines are. So is it WCAG 2.0? Is it 2.1? You know, are you uh, meeting, you know, AAA for some reason, which is, you know, uh, very difficult sometimes to hit? Um, do you need to meet authoring guidelines, et cetera? 
Um, make sure that you identify an accessibility expert. Um, I know that sometimes with, with procurement, you know, that can be really difficult to do. Um, again, something is better than nothing, um, but we really want to try to um, focus again on accessibility first and, and making sure that somebody who really has that uh, deep knowledge is, is on the project. Um, define your tooling, right? Just like we would do with any part of the development process. So that could be uh, Wave. Uh, some of you might actually know Axe. That's part of Google Lighthouse. Uh, Andy is one that's out of the U.S. that I absolutely love. Um, it's open source, part of the Social Security Administration. Um, there are command line tools, uh, Pally, so you can actually incorporate that um, into your dev process so that, uh, again, mostly covers manual, might only get about 30% or so of issues. But again, that's yet another check for you. Um, and then making sure that you're hitting on your manual testing. So that's keyboard, uh, mouse, screen reader. So whether that's voiceover, JAWS, something else, just making sure that you have kind of that those tools in your toolbox. Um, the next piece is making sure that everybody is aligned on what your best practices are. Um, so at least having the knowledge that they, they need um, around the guidelines that you're going to follow and what that means. So when I say everyone, I mean everyone. So right, of course, your accessibility expert, your PMs, your BAs, devs, designers, QAs, UX, usability, might have forgotten a group of people, but just in general, uh, making sure you're focusing uh, on that. And then also educating the client on content accessibility, right? We know sometimes projects start to shift a little bit um, because of content. So because um, there's a lot to write generally when you're you know, redoing a site. So making sure that you're starting very, very early in that education process. So if they are writing content, if they are rewriting, that those best practices are already being thought of and, and in place. So design and usability. Uh, yes, you can actually do accessibility in design and, and do some testing. So the first thing is making sure before design even happens, right? Generally, your designers and your UX experts talk, but you want to bring in a, sorry, an accessibility expert um, as well. And usability expert makes sense too if they're doing testing. Um, you then want to have the accessibility expert actually do an iterative review of the designs. So you know, again, trying to use tooling when you have something that's not interactive not the easiest thing. Um, but at the same time, right, there are ways where you can, you know, of course, uh, test color contrast, you can say, well, if we built it this way, um, you know, there's a risk, it's going to be very difficult, can we try to design it in a different way? Uh, or an accessibility expert might say, hey, developer, uh, you know, X, um, we can actually um, design this and, and develop it, you know, in this way. Uh, and here's some code and, and we can get that ready. So just making sure that that's happening as early as possible. Um, and then hopefully you're able to do usability research um, and do usability testing uh, on your actual designs. So making sure that we're including people with disabilities in the actual testing. Um, so in terms of development process, I don't think I'm going to surprise anybody too much, but um, really just making sure during backlog refinement um, that acceptance criteria, you know, implementation criteria and solution direction and accessibility testing criteria are added. And when I say like ACs and, and solution direction, I don't mean like the typical pieces, right? I mean related specifically to accessibility. They should not be like way down, you know, down in QA and part of your UAT. It should be in the ticket as part of backlog refinement to make sure it is incorporated from the very beginning. Um, at Salsa, um, we have a testing checklist. It's open sourced, uh, have a link to that in the resources as well. Um, but we use it to make sure that all of the appropriate tests are covered. Um, you know, having developers run that accessibility check, um, hopefully they'll be able to do that, right, based off of the fact that we already talked about best practices with them in discovery. Um, and then again, making sure that um, tests are run as part of the QA process. So. Testing, if you're using a design system, it might be on the components first, might not include the site content. So it doesn't mean that that's the only testing that you're doing. Um, but again, that's at least putting you know those pieces in. Um, and then in terms of final UAT, Right, just like we would do, you know, regression testing and final UAT um, with, you know, our QA process, we want to do the exact same thing with accessibility as well. So conduct a final audit on your components, your templates, you know, testing full pages. Um, if your site has uh, real content, that's great, but at least make sure it has representative content. Um, again, add tickets to be completed in UAT. 
as we know, not everything actually gets done uh, in UAT, right? But that's where we start creating um, an audit document or an audit report. Um, again, have that open sourced as well, where um, that link is, is in the resources um, and then providing the report to the client. Um, so I know that's a lot of information to cover in 15 minutes. I can tell you that I can talk about this for hours. Um, if any of you contact me, I probably will. Uh, but that is really uh, the main uh, piece that I wanted to talk about um, today. And, and we'll make sure that we uh, include you know, all of these pieces in uh, the roundtable as well and, and what you're interested in. Um, but I know that I've um, gotten to our 15 minutes and um, wanted to point out for some of the resources, um, WCAG guidelines, um, the terminology that I talked about with disabilities, uh, the overlay fact sheet, that's where I was talking about those accessibility overlays and, you know, why they're not the best idea. Um, this explains why. Um, I have the accessibility blogs. Um, these are the ones that I've written. Of course, there are many others, um, but in regards to, you know, some of the pieces around empathy and barriers and, you know, testing and, and all of the, you know, accessibility gamuts, I should say, um, is included there. And then the starter kit that I was talking about that has, um, you know, the report template, um, testing guidelines. We have uh, how to write content for uh, web accessibility. Those are all um, in there as well. Um, so before we get to the round table, just wanted to see, um, Dave, if we have any questions at all. The live Q&A is open um, and we do have a question here from Ian Humble. And so uh, that question is what important accessibility issues are on your radar that can't be checked or evaluated by online tools uh, such as Wave or, or X, you know? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And there are actually a lot, um, even ones that we think are uh, able to be evaluated um, can't sometimes. So for example, right, we even know alt text, right? That seems like a really easy one that can be tested. But is it good alt text? Is it descriptive? Um, things like that cannot be tested. So even though something looks like it passes, it might not actually pass. Um, there are things, uh, especially, this is a really big one on, on my radar. Um, we see a lot of read more and learn more links. So something that a lot of people don't realize, understandably, if you don't use a screen reader, is that screen reader users can actually pull out like lists of links or headings or write major structural elements to be able to navigate through um, a page and, um, if there is not anything that gives that context, you know, it, whether it's on the screen or through CSS, if somebody pulls that out and say you can't see the screen, all you hear is read more, read more, read more, or learn more, learn more, learn. There's no context to those. Um, I will say, uh, and I hate doing this because I feel like I'm making a plug for myself, but I actually did a session um, last year at Drupal South that was actually on the difference between uh, automated and uh, manual testing. And so in the resource um, link that I have in terms of, um, you know, uh, blogs, et cetera, there is a link to that presentation. Um, and again, I say that not to, uh, you know, uh, avoid your question. It's just, it is one of those things that I, I feel like I could talk about for, um, for a very long time. But um, I, I do think the other important, important thing to note is that while automated testing tools have gotten a lot better. Um, they do only catch about 25 to 30% of issues in general. Um, and so there is, you know, that, that risk where if that's all you're doing, again, it's great, but it's not, you know, getting your full, um, you know, kind of guidelines and, and everything tested. Thanks for that. You talk about kind of weaving the um, the accessibility considerations throughout the project life cycle. Mm -hmm. in, in your experience, like it's a little off-putting for for some people who aren't doing that already. Um, yeah. Because because they think about the overhead, you know, yes. project time yeah. is always is always compressed. Um, but in in practical experience, um, is there an a an easy way to start that, and and b does it really bring an overhead? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it does bring some overhead. However, <laughs> right, there's always a however, um, is the fact that we need to think about what happens in the future, right? Because 
if you don't add accessibility, for example, because of the, the monetary reasons, like because of the overhead, right? There eventually will be issues. Doesn't mean that you're going to get sued. I feel like that's what everybody. Were, well, okay, I live in the U.S., so maybe <laughs> this is a different thing, right? But, but you know, there there is a concern. But um, you know, it's it's the fact that people are going to come back and say, "I can't access this," or "I have to do this," right? And we all know what happens. I feel like we all know, right? What happens after you have done a whole site and then right need to go fix everything after? I mean, you've basically just added who knows how much, like three times, four times, five times, you know, the original budget to go back and fix all of those things. So it's actually a lot cheaper to do it like within the project. The other thing is, and, and yes, this takes a, a long time. So I do not want to make it seem like it's a quick fix, but right, the more people that are trained, the better. Because even if, you know, we, we never really want a single point of failure, but if you have like one designer and one developer, right? And one, you know, usability person and, and you have, you know, hopefully an accessibility person, but if you don't, right, at least you have different people. Then if you at least can combine all of that knowledge together, then at least that helps, you know, move you forward. But if we really want to look at somebody who's like, I don't do any accessibility now. And I'm like, Danielle, you're talking about all this stuff. And I'm like freaked out. Start with those automated tools, right? That That at least is something and then you just keep building that knowledge. So, you know, don't feel like you have to go out and like do every single thing that I talked about on those slides, right? This is coming from 16 years of accessibility, you know, experience. And, and sometimes I miss things. Um, it's just really like anything, it's doing the best that we can. Nice. Yeah, I think it is just about doing the, the best that, that you can, right? And just keep, yeah. keep pushing and keep improving. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's just Alan Cole and Philippa Martin are here on the round table as well. Um, have you guys uh, got any comments or questions? Um, I guess not not specifically comments. I mean, um, we have, it's certainly a way that we've been working recently um, on different projects and we've actually, the three of us have been working on a project or are working on a project at the moment where we've brought it into this um, project life cycle starting really early. And we have found it really useful um, to do that. So I guess that would be my main sort of comment on on, on uh, a lot of what we've talked about today so far. Mm. Uh, to your point before, Danielle, um, I've been on projects before where accessibility hasn't been taken into account um, during the development. And then it came back to us and they were like, we've got an accessibility audit happening on the site. And it added so much overhead like after the fact to retrofit it and you have to double check with designers and say is it okay to change these things to make it accessible so i think the overhead for building it into your process as opposed to the overhead to retrofit it um, after the fact is probably a lot smaller yeah agreed um and yeah dave actually yesterday alan and i were talking about like because we had never had a conversation about how i got into accessibility or how he got into accessibility and, uh, and I think hopefully this will be interesting to other people. It was by accident. Like I didn't decide I want to learn about accessibility. I was a Java developer, God, nobody get mad, uh, <laughs> back in like 2005 or something, uh, doing work with the US federal government. And, you know, we were building this. Nobody really talked about accessibility back then, right? I feel like, I mean, and I hate to say accessibility is like popular, right? But I feel like it's become a more, uh, discuss topic right over the last say five years but back then nobody was talking about it and it was well your application is not going live until you know this is compliance right again as much as we can be but we want to try to hit you know this like 90 to 95 percent threshold um yes that adds so much overhead we had to go back to i think every single screen and this was an application that we were building for like doctors and hospitals to enroll in uh, Medicare. So similar to right what's in, in Australia, huge system. I mean, we probably had to redo, I would say at least 50 screens on an application. I mean, the amount of money that we spent, you know, to Alan's point, doing that retrofitting where yes, there would have been, you know, a little bit more to the budget if we had put it in place then. Um, was just astronomical. Um, I don't even know the figure and uh, I, I'm happy I don't because I have a feeling it probably was close to a million, uh, if not more. 
Um, so yes, <laughs> definitely something um, like just doing the best that you can and, and trying to fit in um, what you can. Uh, I'm curious, when, when do you raise the uh, um, the accessibility conversation with the client? Do, do they front foot it? Do they bring that to you? Or is it up to you to kind of uh, bring their thinking into that space? Yeah, I think it really depends. Um, I will say one thing. Uh, I will praise Australia like nobody's business um, because here in the U.S., I feel like we really have to drive that. Now, some people might be like, oh, yeah, we should do accessibility. But it's like the first thing to go. I feel like every client that I have worked with um, within Australia has said, we want to do 2.0. A lot of them say, like, you must do 2.1. You know, what can we do? What can we learn? Um, I feel like it's something that people are very, very invested in, which is great. Um, and, you know, a lot of times they're starting to understand why they need the budget um, in order to, you know, I hate to say, but like make it happen, right? Um, it's not something that is, um, you know, done automatically um, where they just assume it'll happen and it's just, you know, part of uh, development at, at no cost and, and everything else. Um, but it does make the conversation, I feel like, a lot easier um, to drive. Um, I know, obviously, Alan and Philippa, you've been uh, working um, with accessibility in, in Australia a lot longer than I have. I don't know if you have any other um, thoughts or if you've seen anything, you know, change over the years too in, in regards to the conversation. Well, actually, I thought um, I wouldn't mind using this to segue into um, how I sort of got involved in accessibility. And just to explain, the context for me is very much about content and writing. So um, I'm actually a Celsius content strategist um, and I write content for our clients and also um, a monthly blog we do. And I came into accessibility very much from a professional perspective as a content writer. Um, and I guess I'm showing my age a bit now, but it's also to your point of how it's <laughs> changed over the years. But um, I remember I started off my first marketing communications job and it was sort of like, oh, there's this thing called um, the internet. I think maybe we need to build this thing called a website. Um, and so I have sort of been able to see that, um, that evolution. Uh, and so I think at first, you know, we all started from a content perspective from writing. It was just about, um, you know, that, that classic kind of old style thing of brochure wear. Um, and I wasn't involved in this project for this very first website, but a few years later, I did move into um, specializing in online writing. Um, and through that, I actually um, started finding out a lot more about usability and that early work by Nielsen, which um, goes back a very long time as well. Um, and so I was actually uh, writing content for the online medium that was very much driven by usability and some of those usability studies. Uh, and then of course, also, um, you know, upskilling in, and getting more familiar with um, the WCAG, uh, the guidelines when, when they were around. And there was a lot of crossover and there still is a lot of crossover. Um, so yeah, my approach is very much from that writing content perspective. And so for me, it's really about um, the words and how to make those more accessible. And oftentimes the best practice for usability is also the best practice for accessibility. Uh, so that's really handy as well. And it certainly evolved a lot. And I think to your original question, Dave, about getting people involved early and who's driving that conversation, I think possibly it might be a little bit different for us at Celso just because uh, we have a lot of government clients. And so therefore what we're um, finding is that, you know, they perhaps have more um, vested interest in making sure their websites are accessible. Um, so yeah, and I guess for Alan, um, he's a front end developer. So maybe, um, you know, he has a different, he, he comes at it from a different perspective in terms of the team. I don't know if you wanted to talk a yeah, bit sure. about that, Alan. Yeah, so I guess first I heard about accessibility. I, I did a, a semester at uni on uh, web technologies and they talked about it there. So they kind of uh, foreshadowed, they were saying, hey, this is something you should know about if you're building websites. Um, and then for my first job, I was into a lot of brochure, sorry, e-commerce sites and brochure sites. Um, and it never really came up. And so I sort of knew, I'm like, hey, no one's ever mentioning accessibility here. This is kind of, okay, free reign, I can do whatever. <laughs> 
Um, so that was fun. But then, uh, particularly with salsa as well, is um, a lot of the sites I work on these days are government, and it's a requirement to have accessible sites. So in that case, it makes it a bit more challenging, but it also, what you're building, it feels more correct because you've, you've built it out to the standards and you've got something to compare it to. So I think it helps with the product that you're building to incorporate accessibility into it because I, I feel you get a better product at the end of it. Right. I think, you know, from my point of view, the getting accessibility right, like so much about web is about getting the details right. Um, and you know, I like the point you made there, Philippa, about starting with the content and the messaging and, and good accessibility practices, just good user experience practice, right? Just got another question from the, uh, the oh, sorry to, to talk over you there, Philippa. No, I was just about to say, yeah, no, that's exactly right. There's, you know, a lot of crossover. Um, from a content perspective, and I think from you know often from from a design and, and development uh, perspective, there can be sometimes they can be different. What's um, accessible may not always look as visually appealing as what's not accessible, depending on um, you know the design parameters and the person designing. But it's you know certainly um, important aspects. And from a content from a content writing perspective, it's it's actually quite simple. There are really only kind of five things you need to do when you're writing content, and you're going to meet the accessibility requirements. So it's um, yeah, I think it's a lot easier than people think. And in terms of um, WCAG 2.x and, and WCAG 3, are there any main differences in terms of detail or intent that that we need to be aware of? looking forward <laughs> yes uh we are about to see a, a move and a shake uh in accessibility which is actually really exciting because i think um one of the things that's difficult and uh <laughs> i will say this even as an accessibility consultant and you know lead at salsa i know people who have also been doing this for 15 or 16 years sometimes 20 and we'll talk about say a standard and there will be disagreements on what that standard means because even though it's a standard, even though it's guideline, right? There's no, this is exactly the way that you need to code it, or this is exactly what you need to do. Sometimes it is very clear cut. For the most part, it isn't. Um, it's open to interpretation a little bit. We know that there are a lot of technologies, right? Like not everybody in the world is, you know, coding their sites or, or their applications in Drupal. Um, and so there are different ways to do things. And so what I might consider, you know, a, a failure, somebody might consider a pass and, you know, there's, it's really binary. Um, it's either pass or it's fail. Um, now granted, you know, WCAG 3.0 is still, like I said, in, in talks, I should say, like it's still being edited, but at least what they were talking about a few months ago, they were actually talking about these, you know, different levels, similar to like the A, AA, AAA, but it wasn't in terms of necessarily intensity. Like you could have something that wasn't necessarily pass fail. It's almost like you get sort of an, an in-between. Um, you wouldn't have to worry about having a, you know, percentage for your audit. Um, it's a lot more graceful. I feel like it's a lot more descriptive in terms of what people are thinking. Um, and it's not as technology focused um, in terms of, you know, this is exactly what needs to be done. So even the guidelines as we know them now um, for, say, 2.0 and 2.1 will not be the same as what's in 3.0. Um, and the other piece, right, because I, I sense that maybe if you do know the guidelines or you're just starting to learn them, you're like, oh, no, don't make me learn something new, <laughs> right? But it's actually meant to be easier. It's meant to uh, right, the whole point of accessibility is to make things accessible for all and, and to be inclusive. That's the same thing with the guidelines. They're a lot easier for people to understand. And they're not written in a way where you just sit there and have to go, mm, I'm about to read like three pages of documentation in terms of understanding how to meet this. Um, because I do feel like that's a big barrier for people. Um, I think what the W3C has done is wonderful. I actually know people that, you know, are the ones who help create some of the, the guidelines and, you know, do the reviews. I have so much respect for them, but I do feel like it is a very big barrier to people when they want to understand how to meet something that they just have links and links and pages and pages to try to understand how to meet something. And 3.0, I feel like is going to blow that out of the water and just simplify things um, greatly. So 
I'm, I'm, I'm actually very excited for it to, um, to come out. So I don't think it's going to be for another, uh, year or so. And, uh, I do actually still need to look into 2.2. I will be very honest with that. I think I just got so excited about three, uh, that I kind of skipped a step. So <laughs> eventually I will get back into 2.2 and I'm sure there will be a, a blog post and, and another talk about that, but, uh, but good things are, are coming, um, to help people and, and to, you know, bring everybody in. I think it's interesting what you said, Danielle, there about um, the fact that some, in some ways there's a bit of almost subjectivity over someone will pass it and someone might not pass it. And I think that applies to the content writing. So even though I said before, it's really simple, there's only five things you need to do. I guess there is also that um, subjectivity because, for example, one of them is to, um, to write descriptive page titles. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, some, that may be actually very difficult for for people to write, you know, a short descriptive page title. So while it's, um, they're simple and it could be subjective, one person could say, well, this is short, it's only 20 words. And um, of course, uh, other people would say, well, you know, short's more like four to six words, but uh, so there can be a level of um, subjectivity over that too, where it's not necessarily, you know, the guidelines don't say the titles must be a certain number of words and, and you know, it's not really that prescriptive. So, yeah, I think there is that room for um, interpretation, but also, um, you know, to be honest with yourself as well and sort of when you are sort of deciding whether something is meeting those guidelines as well. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, it, it plays into content, but goes back to an example that I gave before about like learn more and read more. So for me, if I see those, I'm like, okay, if somebody pulls that out in a screen reader, they're just not going to know. But technically, right, if you go like very, very technical, the guideline is for a link in context. So somebody could say, if you have that right in a sentence where it's, you know, learn more about, you know, Etc. Um, and it's in a paragraph, they could say, oh, well, you know, that passes. Well, nobody really is going to know what the context is in, in my mind. So I actually, when I do audit reports, and, and I know uh, Philippa and, and Alan have seen this, where I actually generally have a section where I call out what's subjective and say, you know, accessibility analysts, we'll look at this in a different way. And so, you know, you might have another analyst, you know, look and say that this passes. So just know that, you know, there might be some, some discrepancies there. Um, but yes, I, uh, it, it's always good to, to call those things out, but it is, you know, understandable when people do get a little um, confused uh, as to, uh, as to what the right thing is. And um, I think to, to say to that, there is no, necessarily write. Um, there's try, there's learn, um, there's do. You might not always succeed, but that's how we learn. And then we do it, you know, again, right? And and we go from there. Um, nobody's perfect. And um, that's good because things would be really boring, but we just, uh, we do what we can and, and we just kind of keep building um, on, on what we know. Uh, so another question from the audience here. Um, you know, uh, if someone's confident that they're AA compliant from their technical side, um, and this mm -hmm. is from uh, this is from Joe Taylor in the uh, VicGov STP, the biggest problem is awareness and understanding um, across distributed authors, and this is a big trend we're seeing in our client base across the public sector as well. Everyone wants to push authorship out to the fringes, out to the subject matter experts, but they. Uh, 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 you know, one more step removed from the project decision making. So have you got any hints and tips about how to bring them along on that accessibility journey um, and, you know, not wanting content in, in PDF form or not wanting to, to, to post up docs, you know? I mean, I, I think it's about training. I mean, literally last week um, I ran a session for one of our clients that specifically looked at... Um, uh, that was went to their whole their whole organization but largely it's going to be people who are writing the content and sort of looked at what web writing best practice is and took them through that from both a usability perspective and a um, accessibility perspective and so it actually give, gave them the knowledge because obviously if people don't know what they're supposed to do it's very hard for them to do it so if they don't know how they can write in a way that's accessible um, and then other things like, you know, alt tags for images, which again can be part of the training. So, you know, I do believe that 
uh, it's a really good idea to actually train content authors um, across writing but with that lens of being writing content that's good for usability that's good for accessibility and anything else that comes under the content author role such as loading images etc should be covered as well perhaps another question for you philippa uh, is there an educational grade level or a reading level that you typically target um, in your content writing i mean particularly for government websites i guess where you do have that mandate for uh, accessibility for everyone Yep. So there is. Um, this is actually addressed in the WCAG uh, 2.1 and 2.0, and it is. It should be lower secondary primary. Sorry, lower secondary. Um, so that obviously means year seven to eight. Uh, the DTA, so the Digital Transformation Agency, actually recommends um, year seven. So it's about you know choosing those really simple words, keeping the sentences short and and simple, um, so that you are writing for a year seven level. And in fact, I think in um, the UK, the UK government style guide, um, last time I checked their style guide, they were actually recommending even lower. They were talking about writing for a 10 year old to read. So yes, that's sort of the level, at least yes, I'd say year seven for Australia to, to keep in line with the Digital Transformation Agency recommendations. And, uh... On the sites that you're doing, are, are you providing much dialogue or information around uh, your accessibility considerations and approaches on the website itself? Um, like, you know, accessibility page, or do you, do you have that conversation with your audience directly and say, this is what we're doing, this is how you do it? Um, so everything that we are creating is open sourced. So whether we are talking to clients, whether we are talking to, you know, their stakeholders, whether we are uh, helping others, you know what I mean, throughout uh, other agencies, um, we are trying to share the information as much as possible. Um, I actually used to work for an accessibility company for like a, a short term. Um, there are all of these products out there and, and everything else, and, and they're great. But I do feel like a lot of times, and understandably, right, it's a business, um, you have to pay for all of these videos, right, to, to learn more and to figure out what to do. Um, again, it's a business model. It's very complex. Somebody has to do it. But, you know, when we were talking at Salsa, when I, when I came in and, um, you know, started our practice, it was, well, I have this whole testing checklist and it's like really, really robust, like what do we do? And it was like, well, what do you mean? What do we do? We open source. And I was like, oh, good. Okay. I just thought that would be like, not okay for some reason, you know, because again, a lot of people are able to charge. And I mean, I think it says something just about how important it is that we're recognizing, you know, that we need to teach. Like I, I use the word evangelizing and, you know, it's not meant in like a religious way, right. It's meant to be the fact that like, you need to educate other people. And uh, once you know how to do the basics, right, you teach people on the basics. And once you know more than the basics, you teach more people on the basics. And that's how we really grow. I mean, my dream, and it's probably going to take another like six months to a year, um, is to start creating an accessibility community of practice. You know, maybe it'll be amongst, um, you know, the digital agencies, right, that are part you know, part of um, Drupal South, maybe, you know, we can get government involved, you know, I know that there are some communities of practice already, like the more that we can do, um, the better. So I know that was a little bit more, um, Dave, than, than what you asked, but I, I still think it's super important um, for us to just make sure that, yeah, we're, we're sharing the knowledge out. It's not something that we uh, need to keep. It's not proprietary. Um, share, share with the world, and uh, you know that's why we're here. So, All right. I think that sounds fantastic. Uh, we're just coming up to our last minute here. So, um, any other kind of final comments or anything else you'd like to say? Um, I will definitely hit you up about that uh, accessibility practice in our region. Though. So, that's <laughs> yeah, we're great. Very keen on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I I know that we've we've stressed this, but it really is just getting started. Um, you know, I I know that um, slides will be shared out, the recording will be shared out as well. Um, please also, I know that I shared my um, you know contact information as part of my presentation. Please feel free to contact me, um, and you know I can help uh, route you to Philippa and, and Alan and anybody else um, who you know is able to assist. Um, 
we care deeply about accessibility. We care deeply about um, you know, being empathetic, um, of course, to other people. Um, and just the fact that you all, you know, were attending and, and asking questions just means so much and, and shows how important it is. Um, and Dave, thank you very much for uh, moderating. You know, I know that there were some questions from the live Q&A, uh, but I know that you came with questions as well. Um, and it's just been a great conversation to have. So just wanted to thank everybody for uh, for having us. And uh, hopefully we can do this next year in, in person. But um, thank you so much, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. That was an awesome presentation. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye. Cheers.